are a uh, true museum. We're a 501c3 board managed nonprofit located in Alameda, California. Um, with over 100 games set to free play and a static collection of about 15 games that are historic in nature that aren't playable but are great examples of pinball history that we have available for our patrons. I'm going to start by talking about the difference between arcades, barcades, and museums. Um, we do believe that there are there's plenty of room for both of these entities to exist, and they have very different functions and different missions. Um, they're both fun. Um, we talk a little bit about how there's over 10,000 locations in the United States for actually all of North America for pinball play, and a lot of them are arcades or barcades, and there are pinball museums as well with over 41,000 games that are available for patrons and customers to play. That's a lot of pinball. And we, they're both valuable and they both extend that game to people to play. Um, barcades are popular for young adults and older customers, um, but a lot of children and younger team players are left out. A lot of barcades that serve alcohol um, don't necessarily allow under 21 to play pinball in their games. Um, museums serve all ages. They serve all ages from infants and strollers that come into our museum um, up to people in their 90s which come and play. Um, for instance, at the Pacific Pinball Museum, we do actually have a retired gentleman in his 70s who brings his almost 100-year-old mother once a week to the museum to play. And it's amazing. It's a dynamic game and it keeps her sharp. Um, and they both enjoy playing pinball. Um, arcades and barcades in general are smaller um, than some of the larger museums, um, anywhere from 1 to 20 or 30 games, um, whereas we have over 100. And uh, some other locations that are large in the United States have a lot of games as well. Um, barcades generally have newer games. Um, their private, uh, private arcades and barcades will be buying new games from Stern, Jersey Jack, um, Spooky Pinball. And we as a museum, taking donations, not buying new games ourselves, generally have more older games that have been donated or games that are in our reserves that we use. Um, barcades and arcades are also usually coin and card operated. Um, so you're paid to play per game. Uh, many museums are single charge, either for a block of time, a couple hours, or like us at the Pacific Pinball Museum, it's all day play. You can play from 11 o'clock when we open until nine o'clock when we close the entire day and come in and out without paying per game. Um, this allows a different type of play. We have a lot of people that play very well at the museum because they're not stressing about the loss of their quarter. Um, they're able to play the game like I have to. If I run into a new game, I have to play it three or four times before I really know what's happening with that game. Um, I get comfortable with it the first time. It usually rocks me. Um, the second time, I'm understanding the rules. And the third or fourth time, I actually put up a half decent score. And that's hard when you're spending money per play. Um, it just allows a different exploration of the game and how different the eras of pinball really are between, say, a wood rail from the 40s or 50s, games from the 60s or 70s with the larger flippers, up to the modern games from the 90s forward. I'm going to turn things over to Mike. He's going to talk a little bit about the Pacific Pinball Museum's history. Yeah, all right. Um, I know almost everybody in the audience, so... <laughs> I really, I really don't have to talk too much about this, but I'll, I'll say, um, you know, when we started out, there wasn't any place to play pinball, um, and I had bought a bunch of pinball machines, didn't know what to do with them, I was going to turn them, I was going to make kinetic art sculptures, um, couldn't do it, <laughs> I tried. Um, I eventually found a place that was cheap enough to rent. I thought, well, I'll just, I'm just going to put these in here because I, I want, I'd like to see people playing pinball again. We put out a little cigar box and took uh, five bucks to help pay for the rent. Um, so that was a little too much for some people, like Hal. Um, he just couldn't come up with the five bucks. But we, uh, we continued and eventually got on the path to uh, being a nonprofit. I used to work at the Exploratorium, <clears throat> and I really loved what the Exploratorium did. It was a place where you could go f and learn about electricity, uh, physics, uh, whatever you were interested in, they would have an exhibit on it. And I thought, um, that, that's an incredible thing that they're doing, because uh, where else, there was no other place in the 
country that i knew of that was actually a a museum that would do that kind of stuff so i thought well it'd be great to do that with pinball because at this point i was fixing exhibits for these companies and um uh I noticed that they, they break a lot because of the public. And at that point, I discovered that pinball is pretty sturdy. The, it's, it's pretty hard to break a pinball machine. It happens all the time, I know. But com com compared to science exhibits, they last a lot longer. So I thought, well, it'd be great if you could combine the two. And so that's kind of where the museum uh, and the nonprofit took, took hold. Was <clears throat> the idea was to have a place where people could explore pinball we could also explore electricity, math, things like that. Uh, other people s saw the value of this. We started doing um, more and more uh, ex expansions into various rooms where we were. And then eventually we started doing these shows. The shows really caught on. And it was, it was a different kind of show because we, I don't know if, if you'd all been to those, but they, focused on some of the older machines that kind of were forgotten. It seemed that pinball was starting to, to sprout, but it was interested in the newer games, totally. We thought, you know, we need to respect the past and really, uh, if you've never played an older pinball machine, how do you know it sucks, you know? <laughs> so, so we started putting them out there and it was surprising how many people uh, not only liked them, but actually honed in on the older machines. We had one kid, Ben, who would come out uh, from Tennessee specifically to hook up with Richard Conger and uh, Dan Miller and play the old mechanical games. And that's all he would play, he wouldn't, wouldn't touch a new one. Um, so we started to see the value of this. Um, we expanded up to the point where we moved on to Webster Street in Alameda <clears throat> and that triggered a, um, we, we actually wanted to get a permit for this painting the sign, and that's what triggered a visit from the um, uh, Alameda permit people, where they declared that we were illegal, and they, they had the lawyers there. It was, it was kind of a scary moment, except I'd already read the law, and we had, uh, that's one of the reasons that we went to free play on our machines, is because it was illegal to have at Pinball Arcade in Alameda at that time. And uh, so we got around that. Then um, it seemed like a lot of other places around the country started picking up on that method of um, not taking coins into the machines and making them on free play to do uh, what Evan said, let people play as much as they needed to on a machine without having to dump quarters into it, but also to get around the local laws. There And there's still, so many laws on the books about uh, pinball and its uh, legality. So that was one way uh, for them to get around it. It's been amazing what's happened. There's pinball has just exploded and um, we feel like we're a, a big part of that. It's, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, Tim in the uh, Pinball Hall of Fame and I started on our nonprofit quest at, at the same time and we both got there about the same time it takes about six months um, and we're both nonprofits he's doing a lot better than we are <laughs> uh, and but we're both we're both very different purposed um, and we'll go into that a little bit later but uh, it's it just kind of interesting how we both kind of grew with with the expansion of pinball in America and I think we could talk a little bit about um, it started in the back room of our current building um, with some games that were on free play and we slowly annexed uh, more space in our Webster Street location over time to now kind of the ultimate space that we're able to use there right now um, with six different exhibits. Um, we have future exhibits planned. Um, and we have some exciting news about the overall kind of ultimate setup of the museum whether that's a year, five years, or 10 years down the road that we'll get into a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but Mike touched a little bit on the different exhibitions that we've been able to sit on at the Marin, at the Marin Civic Center and even at our warehouse um, in the past. And now we'll talk a little bit about what makes a museum, um, using us as an example in this case, different than a barcade or an arcade. 
Um, with our 501c3 nonprofit status, we're able to apply for different types of government, state, and local support. Uh, we have different types of tax benefits. Um, we're very volunteer supported. Um, we probably rely on volunteering from educated people, people that help out with the museum, people with great backgrounds to support a really large amount of what we do, probably 70% of what we're able to accomplish. And we're managed by a board. Um, we're managed by an elected board of officers. Um, the current president is Larry Zartanian, which a lot of you might know, might be here today. I'm looking for him in the audience right now. And um, moving on to the accessibility, um, we touched a little bit, touched a little bit of that in um, a little earlier. Um, all ages, um, we even provide stools for children to be able to access the machines. And it's, it's dicey under about seven years old in terms of hand-eye coordination, but it's amazing how many kids are able to pick it up quickly because it is a simple game. Whether it's a new or old game, you're just trying to keep the ball from draining, and that's something people can get a hold of pretty easily from a young age. And, we, and if they stay in it, um, we have a 13-year-old that comes to league and is able to clean up sometimes. Um, in league. Um, she's got those young motor skills and a quick twitch <laughs> response and it's just amazing to see someone that young play against older seasoned players and because pinball's a little bit of chance, a little bit of skill mix, um, sometimes she's able to topple people in the top five which is really amazing. Um, the stools also help elderly or older uh, people and uh, people that have uh, different restrictions in terms of disability play the games as well. Um, the games are actually pretty accessible for people in the wheelchair in terms of their height, and we make sure there's space available for that as well. Um, our main mission um, is preservation, and preservation really entails not only protecting these machines and making sure they're stable and they're there and kept in good shape, but making them accessible. Uh, preservation isn't just putting things in a warehouse. It's making sure that these rotate out to the public, that people are able to access them. Um, while maintaining them in the meantime, uh, making sure the humidity and temperature are okay for these older games. Um, if people that have the older games know very well that if they don't get played for a while, they can get strange, kind of like older cars, um, they need to be exercised. And bringing them to the public is one way we're able to do that. Um, some of the things we've done with our mission of preservation is our photography project. Um, during the COVID lockdown, the museum was closed for 14 months and we were able to catalog almost all of our collection that was in the warehouse. And by cataloging, I mean we actually pulled each game individually out of the collection, set it up in a special environment for very high resolution photography with really wonderful lighting, and we're able to take very high resolution pictures of some of the examples that we have that are the only ones that we're aware of to make sure that the, at minimum, the artwork, uh, play field layouts, and the original scopes of the machine are preserved no matter what, digitally. And we're currently in the process of making sure we can make that accessible to people um, through the same software that the um, National Archive uses. And uh, we're currently working on that. That's one of our fundraising, uh, fundraising projects. Um, our warehouse um, is organized, cataloged, numbered, um, recorded in terms of manufacturer, um, where the game is located, and how many copies of that game we have. Um, if it's a rare game, we'll maintain multiple copies. If it's a game that is common, generally we'll maintain one copy, the better one for our warehouse and for the museum, for posterity, and one of the other games might be used for fundraising. Um, an aspect of what we do special, uh, especially in this museum, is also making sure really unique, old and rare games come out to the public. Um, a really great example of this is this special Go Girl game, um, which is from the 1990s. It's an art game that was customized, and it's a, um, it's a pride-themed game that was made available in San Francisco for many years and kind of achieved a legendary status. It's a, a drag queen-themed game. It's the only one ever made, one of the first real custom art games that was about 10 years ahead of all other pinball games when it was manufactured in terms of its software, taking pictures, um, doing customization on the screen in the late 90s. Um, really ahead of the curve game, and there's only one example of it. And we currently have that game in our warehouse. We have brought it out to two events. Um, we plan on that being part of an exhibit in the future. Um, but making sure that game, which is really well known in the Bay Area, is accessible to people again, has been repaired, and is being taken care of is really important to us. 
um, Spooksville, a game which is currently in the museum in our oddball exhibit, which we'll talk about a little bit about later, is a really unique game, one of only two upright pinball shaker games that were made by Alley Leisure. We have both. Um, Spooksville's the one that we're able to have in the museum for patron play. It is such a special, unique game, the upright cabinet playing off of a mirror. You're just not going to find it in many places. Um, it blows people's minds. It's a prototype, almost arcade-style cabinet that they made to try to reduce footprint. It's just not something you'll see. We've had people come in that have not seen that game for 40 years and are surprised we have one. Um, the safe cracker game, which we currently have in the same oddball exhibit, there are safe crackers that are available in other places to play and during conventions. We have one of the few that actually has coins in it. Um, having one of our volunteers take calibers to an original safe cracker coin and find a very obscure casino coin that would also fit inside safe cracker and would let you utilize the assault the vault function was really important um, to us that we allowed that game to play the way it should and we really appreciate uh, Dan Miller's help with that. Um, getting those coins and that's not only a keepsake for people in the museum, but it lets you play the game as it was originally met. Um, there are games on location that will let you play Safe Cracker, but they miss an entire feature of that game if you don't have coins in it. Next, we can talk a little bit about what makes, uh, we can continue the uh, differences in the museum and talk a little bit about the different exhibits we've had. Um, we've had a pinball style exhibit where we discussed the different, uh, the different clothing, cars, colors, and art style types. Um, our Art Stenholm exhibit, um, which was a really special exhibit, which had a very unique uh, take on pinball art because Art Stenholm had two daughters and it affected his artwork. At a time when there was a lot of gratuitous art uh, in pinball, his art was actually very accessible by both sexes and uh, was not as biased as a lot of the other artwork you'd see at that time, um, which made it really unique and special for the 1960s. Um, Pointy People, which is one of our current exhibits um, that's in the same room the Art Stenholm used to be, uh, is the art of Jerry Kelly and Christian Marsh, and that is a particular art style from the late 60s, early 70s, where everything's made out of triangles. It's very pointy. <laughs> it is really pointy people, and it's a fantastic art style that was really unique and for a specific amount of time. And being able to dedicate um, rooms and then also someone to curate and write about these different art styles, um, influences, and specific artists is really special for a museum. Um, you might find these games in the wild, you might find them at a convention, but being able to gather them together and talk about them as a specific story is really special and important and really educating for people. I think you might be able to talk a little bit about um, institutional partnerships, Mike. Yeah, um, it's interesting too, I, before we get into that, we did, uh, when we first started out, we're still in the, uh, the, the Lucky Juju room, which was the original room. I really got into pointy people and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to take out all the machines. I'm just going to, you know, f f I'm going to do a one month show about pointy people, about Christian Marsh, basically. And I remember one, the first person to show up had come all the way from LA and I was thrilled. You know, really? You came all the way from LA to, to see the Christian Marsh? Yeah. Uh, well, I wasn't really here to see the Christian Marsh. I just wanted to see an arcade that didn't have any Gottlieb machines in it. <laughs> it's a little disappointing for me. Because um, I worked with um, the Exploratorium, I got to work at museums all over the world. Um, I think one of the most famous ones I worked at was the um, Museum of Natural History in London, and uh, actually got keys so I could go anywhere in the museum and it was it was mind-boggling um, but I, I got to learn a lot about museums um, how they worked um, and the different types of museums and, and the people they attracted so it got me a little more focused on, on what the what our museum could be um, and in doing so I we um, we hooked up with some other institutions that wanted to, to uh, take some of, of our exhibits, take some of our um, pinball machines and introduce them to other people. One of them was the Museum, oh gosh, they were in Palo Alto, uh, of American Heritage. And um, it was 
a little a tiny little museum but we managed to fill it with with older machines and it really blew people away because they just hadn't seen anything like that that there's an era of pinball that just kind of forgotten and where we were unearthing this stuff and it was it was very interesting to see the reaction what what we've done is gone to Chabot Space and Science Center we've gone to the Golden Gate Academy of Sciences and then we actually went to the Faino Museum in Wolfsburg Germany and that was probably the biggest show that we'd ever done and it had to we had to pack all these games and exhibits into one 40-foot container it went uh, across the ocean and then uh, my wife and Melissa and I went over there to set everything up and everything made it okay except for I had this one uh, exhibit about uh, Galton, uh, Sir Francis Galton, it's called a, <coughs> a Galton pinball where you launch the balls and it eventually makes a, a, ball, a bell curve uh, when all the balls filter down to the bottom. Uh, all the balls, I put it in this airtight sealed container. For some reason, all the balls, brand new balls, 100 of them, all rusted by the, when I pulled them out of the container. So we had to go and get new balls, but they didn't have American pinballs. They had metric balls. I'm, I'm not kidding you. So it behaved a little differently, but uh, it was probably an uh, incredible uh, exhibition especially for Germany because they just never get to see stuff like this. It since uh, has spawned another uh, museum in Germany that is a pinball museum. Um, the, we did a show at uh, Chabot Space and Science Center uh, uh, with Dan Miller and that was really well received. Both of these uh, shows that we did in Wolfsburg and Chabot were the number one shows that they'd ever done. So it, it just goes to show, you know, this is a popular venue and the things that it, that it does that a regular barcade doesn't do is you, you get people in and you get them playing a pinball machine and then you get them over on an exhibit and they're still having fun. And when people are having fun and uh, playing with an exhibit or a machine, they're open to learning. It's just something that's, that uh, museums and educators have known for a long time. Uh, your, your mind just tends to open up and, and explore things when you're having fun. Um, so that's an important part of what our museum does. We try uh, to come up with exhibits that engage people, get them lost in, the, in having fun playing it, and then there's part of that game or exhibit that is, you're going to learn something about gravity, about vectors, about math, um, and the basic physics of gravity. Uh, so simple stuff up to complex stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that when we get more funding, our exhibits will get a little more complex and we'll be able to put more electronics into it and things like that. Right now we're dealing with, with simple things, um, springs, gravity, vectors, things like that. So. Something that makes um, institutions like museums and nonprofits special is being able to coordinate with those other museums and nonprofits. Um, you could have an amazing private collection. It would be very hard to partner with a large nonprofit museum um, if you're not also a nonprofit, understanding that nature and having a specific mission of making things accessible, playable, and a learning uh, background to the public. Um, that's really seed when we go to, say, the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco for their Cal Nightlifes. Um, we bring five to six games, set them up in their atrium. It's amazing the amount of people which come to that event which have never played pinball. Um, these are people in their 20s and or even early 30s that have never approached a machine. And kind of what we're able to allow in our museum with free play, those are set on free play as well, and we introduce an entire new generation and background of people to these games in another museum and another institution. Um, Mike touched a little bit about uh, us partnering with USS Hornet, which is also in Alameda. We, uh, we're able to offer discounts to each other's patrons um, if they visit 
each other museum on the same day and that's because we're both nonprofits we're able to extend that and that's okay and uh, Mike talked a little bit about going international I mean taking a pinball exhibit to Europe is amazing and we're also talking about what we can do in the future to extend pinball to other countries and other continents as well which is a really great opportunity for us we can move into why pinball museums aren't just fun but they're actually crucial um, they're really, really important to have. And an aspect of that we've talked a little bit about is introducing pinball eras of all eras to new generations, not just offering games from the 80s or 90s forward, which are very popular and well known and in the top 10 list, but offering, say, obscure games from the late 40s, 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s as well. Um, for instance, in the museum, we're able to offer Humpty Dumpty from 1947 that got leave with the very first flippers. And it's mind-blowing to people that they're able to walk up to a machine from 1947 and play it routinely, and it gets a lot of play. And we're able to talk about the story, um, the history of pinball to people in a way they've never, never thought about. Um, seeing the flipper as a gimmick, they, a lot of people have assumed flippers have always existed on games, but showing them that this was originally a gimmick which was introduced on the sides of the game with an interesting format um, and how it took off and people started retrofitting old boards with games and then after a couple of years you see them drop to the bottom of the machine like modern day pinballs they're figuring things out is a really fantastic story to weave for patrons that come into the museum regardless of the age they are. Uh, making sure that young and old people are able to access those games from all eras is really important because it is the same game but they do play differently of course. Um, older games have five balls and play a little bit slower, are less complex, but still very challenging. Newer games only have three balls, but they can be very forgiving and uh, can give you warnings before tilting out and adjusting your play for each game. Um, very specifically for someone like me, playing a game like Sing Along, which I really enjoy, and learning how to understand that little post in the center and trusting that the ball will bounce off of that instead of trying to hit it. Um, and not having that in any modern games is a really interesting lesson to learn and really interesting way to adjust your play. Um, in our collection in the warehouse and as a static collection inside the museum itself, we're also able to preserve pinball from the 19th century. Um, the oldest game that we have in the museum for people to take a look at is a bagatelle from the 1880s with the Redgrave plunger that originally reduced that game in size from the large tabletop version to that smaller version with the pins to direct the ball. And we have a reproduction of that bagatelle that's playable in the museum. It's actually one of our most sought after games. Um, we have children and adults go head to head on that game for an hour at a time, keeping track. Um, our theory is that there's nothing between the person playing and what's happening on the game, making it really dynamic and interesting. It's a simple game, but it's really fun, and making sure that that is playable by people so they can understand the progression of pinball. Um, we're also able to do things with our exhibits and the uh, museum layout to present uh, problematic themes in games within a context. Um, we're able to assemble games of a certain art style, and we can talk about the good and bad aspects of that. Um, we were able to address things like sexism in pinball um, as they were originally designed and presented to people in bars, billiards halls, and gambling clubs. Um, we can see the evolution of artwork in pinball games to modern day where it's more accessible and appealing to a broader audience and we can talk about that. Um, we do have plans in the future for pinball games that can address issues around games produced during World War II that have interesting context and artwork, um, games that have military themes, um, games that are based on comic book styles, and we even have a special exhibit coming up in the near future where we're gonna focus on games that were designed and have major impacts by women in pinball, um, which is a really fascinating story that we're gonna be able to talk about. Something we're also able to offer, and we can see that um, in the uh, Wired Magazine article, that has Mike in it that we've used. Um, a great title, Keeping Pinball History Alive One Flipper at a Time, is a wonderful interview. Um, pinball does have, and Mike can expand on this a little bit, uh, Mike, um, pinball does have ups and downs. Um, it has popularity uh, moments, and it has moments where it's very popular. It goes up and down over time. Um, we've seen that through the 70s, 80s, 90s, up to the present day. However, the museum is able to operate continuously offering different generations of games for everybody all of the time. Um, we've got longevity 
Um, we're in it for the long haul. We plan on, we have decades of planning and things we're trying to achieve as opposed to opening, say, a single location as a bar, arcade or barcade and just wanting to operate for a while for money. We have kind of a bigger goal and mission in mind. Yeah, you, you said it. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Uh, one of the first things uh, I had to do was buy parts for these pinball machines that I'd set up in this room. So I had to call up Steve Young from Pinball Resource. I'm sure a lot of you know him. Uh, and one of the most interesting things he said to me was, pinball has cycles. It goes up, it goes down. I, I was like, hmm doesn't seem that way, but <laughs> I had just gotten into it, so I, I didn't know. Um, and it seemed like, well, oh, it's, it's picking up. And by the time we did our third or fourth show, the one company that was around, uh, Stern, um, Gary Stern had come up to me and said that, uh, gee, you know, you guys are doing great at stimulating interest in pinball. And, um, I believe a couple of years before, he said he was going to throw in the towel that he was winding down. Comes back and says, nope, we've just hired uh, Steve Ritchie, and we're going to start making pinballs again, seriously, because he was making some pretty crappy machines at that point. <laughs> so he hires Steve Ritchie, and, um, you know, I started to see the whole thing kind of turn around, and it's amazing because there are some pretty heavy cycles in pinball. It, it is going way up uh, in popularity. There, there are 19 manufacturers making pinball machines right now. I, some of them are small boutique, but 19 companies making pinball. And then a ton more on top of that, making all the, um, the art pieces and you know, uh, things and toppers and things like that that people use to soup up their games. But uh, I noticed, yeah, it's going way up, and then all the prices shot way up um, when banning went under and, and uh, all these people were getting into pinball and uh, the prices went skyrocketing. Now I see it leveling off. <laughs> I, again, I, I'm ordering parts from Steve all the time. I asked him, I said, hey, um, what do you think now? What do you, you know, the cycle obviously has gone way up. And he goes, yeah, I think it's peaked out. I <laughs> think it's starting to come down. And it started making me realize that, um, that this was a good thing. Our pinball museum is a good thing because all, one reason for it was it doesn't depend on the popularity of pinball to maintain itself. Uh, that's what a nonprofit has to cope with is what we have to do. So we have to continually raise money. Most of our money comes from admissions, uh, and we're not, we're not very adept at fundraising. Um, so even though we have raised some money and we're, and we're holding on to that, we need to raise a lot more because we need to get our own space. But the other important thing is we have to stay open. Um, somebody, I think it was that gentleman back there, Jeff uh, Cuse, he said, are you guys going to be a flash in the pan? <laughs> because he loves pinball. He wants to play pinball all the time. And I said, no, we're not going to be a flash in the pan. We're, we're going to, this is going to be an institution and we're going to keep it going. Um, we have actually set aside money that is an emergency funding that got us through the pandemic. We weren't able to open during the pandemic, but we paid our rent and paid for the warehouse out of this funds. And coming out on the other side, we're starting to add to that fund again. And the whole idea behind it is so that we can get our own place so that we will truly be permanent. And we won't, um, one thing that a lot of people don't know, it's free to come to our museum. if. Uh, we only ask for money if you want to play, but we have an extensive amount of educational material. Uh, Chris and Evan and, and Melissa all uh, did a lot of research and came up with a bunch of um, handouts that you can do a self-guided tour of the museum. And the, the incredible thing about this that helps with our permanence is 
the schools have picked up on this and they realize, wow, uh, there was one lady who, um, she was an uh, army um, a military family, so they moved around a lot. And she sent us an email saying, you know, um, I go to a lot of these museums that are supposed to be educational and, you know, I take my kids because they're homeschooled and, you know, we go there and go here and try to pick up educational things that weren't missing at home. We came to your museum and we thought we were just going to play, but it turns out that your, your museum is the most educational museum that we've been to, which made my heart swell with pride because, I, I mean, it, it, I'm really, really devoted to that. I, th I think, uh, we're like, we were, we were some of the first ones, to, we were the first ones to build the clear pinball machines. That kind of caught on. A lot of people were building the clear pinball machines. Uh, but we've gone ahead and, and developed a lot of these exhibits that, um, we, and we've applied for grants, but we're, we're right in that niche where we're, we're too small and we're pinball, you know? Uh, I think the first thing that the, City of Alameda did it was pinball museum. Yeah, right. It's an arcade, <laughs> I mean, and we have to talk our way back out of that, saying no, no, we, this is what we do. We had a heck of a time with the assessor's office. They wouldn't let us do all sorts of stuff, and they actually pulled our exemption because we had a private party once. So we're up against a lot of difficult. Um, well, I, I guess. Uh, people just don't understand exactly what a pinball museum can be because they've always been arcades. There's been no uh, museum like what we do. And I do a lot of research online and, and find out, well, our, you know, what, what else is out there? Because we can learn from them, share from them. Um, it's, I, I look to, uh, you know, to, to uh, Tim and, and what he did, I realize he's, he's gone a, a different route. He's, he wants to um, keep pinball alive, but it, it's, he's not doing any of the educational part. He's more of a fundraising arm for the uh, Salvation Army, which is great. Um, I don't want to do that, and we didn't want to do that with the museum. We want to be a museum that is going to be permanent that will always have education as a heart of, of what we do and also preservation. Because I figure at some point it's going to be pretty hard to play pinball again and we'll be there for that with your help. We could see, um, just to talk a little bit about the different pictures we have up here, you could see the uh, clear pin which uh, Mike and the PPM first, uh, first produced and made the first one and you can see that game in action at uh, Space Chabot Center uh, being played by young gentlemen. And you could also see the Dalton boarded pin chime up on the top right hand side. And underneath that, you could see one of the many field trips that we have come to the museum. That was a great group of kids. They were just ecstatic about playing uh, pinball games. Imagine that, going to school and for your science class, uh, I was talking about physics, you're going to a pinball museum and you get to play. Um, that really leans into our, our main mission statement, which is to play and learn. Um, it's not a trick, it's just that you learn best when you play. And um, on the top left hand side, you can see one of the uh, recent classes that we had out at our annex. Um, this, these are some of the different things that make a pinball museum special and crucial. And that was hosting one of Mark Gibson's wonderful um, classes where you're talking about working on pinball. And I really hope you guys stay afterward after the next presentation following up after this, uh, Mark and David. Um, they're just fantastic classes and being able to offer a space where we have a large amount of those games available. Um, we've got a space where people can come, um, they can attend these classes, we can extend that knowledge about pinball of different age ranges and eras to have more people and make sure the game stays viable and people can have their own games at home in the future. Um, we can see one of the uh, really special exhibits on the bottom left hand side that Mike had produced with the neon showing the activity of old bumpers. And that not only is pretty to watch, but it also lets people see underneath that acrylic piece and see how pop bumpers work. Uh, bumpers can work so quickly that you're not necessarily sure of how they work until people take a look underneath and they see, wow, look at that disc, and that kicks the ball back out. Really, really cool stuff.
So we can now uh, get, um, talk a little bit about what we need as a leading institution, um, as a true pinball museum, and uh, kind of what we're trying to accomplish in the future. Um, there are pros and cons of running a nonprofit, and I think uh, you might be able to expand a little bit about that, Mike. Yeah, I can talk a lot about that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I get asked all the time, gee, wouldn't you rather be a barcade? I got to say, no. Um, I, I just, you know, it, it, uh, I, I really like what we're doing. Um, it, is, it is a harder road to travel, I got to admit. Um, but in the in the long run, um, the the nonprofit route for something like this, I think, is is going to increase the chances. Well, it's going to make it more likely to be permanent. Um, now, most nonprofits start with an endowment. We didn't do that. We started with 16 machines and went from there. <laughs> and uh, the thing that amazed me was the uh, Tom. Sawyer, I guess, effect, because uh, I've worked pretty hard on this stuff. People come by and go, oh, what are you doing? Are you fixing the Can I help? I go, yeah, you got an apple? You know, they never would have the apple, but sure they could help. And that's the amazing thing, the camaraderie, and, and I see a lot of you people that have helped. Uh, the, the volunteer aspect of it is incredible, because um, uh, the EM machines are simple enough to where you can you can teach people pretty easily. Hey, this switch, you know, you got to clean it. And this is how it works. This is how a stepper works. The schematics are simple enough to where, you know, it's it's just a complicated toaster. You know, so you can really use pinball machines to to um, teach people about um, electrical circuits, mechanics, things like that. Um, but the camaraderie that happens when we get all sorts of people in to help fix the machines. So we do that every Monday uh, when we're closed. We have a, a, a core group of people that come in and uh, work till midnight or sometimes later <laughs> fixing these games. Uh, and it's just, uh, I, it's a real feeling of accomplishment somehow that, uh, that we've gotten to that point where all these people just come, and fix machines, and we do the same thing at the annex. Um, we not only uh, have organized and uh, uh, categorized, and, and we know where every machine is. That, that was always amazing because before it just it was kind of a mess, and now you go on your phone and you you go, oh, where's this machine? Oh, it's over there and you go there and there it is you know it's it's it, that always blows my mind because when you're dealing with i think we have up to 1300 mm -hmm. unique machines right now now we're uh we've been pulling our duplicates and we are going to have a big sale is it too early to mention that no not at all on june 2nd we're going to have a, a big sale of all our duplicates we've got um, a lot of really interesting stuff i mean some of it's not even pinball um and we hope that we're going to be able to uh, reduce the amount of space that we use. We're, uh, one reason, uh, one way we're surviving uh, the, the rent on the, we have a, the annex is 44,000 square feet. We got a good deal from the city, but it's still really expensive. It's 44,000 square feet. And we are reducing our footprint so that we can sublease a little bit more and hopefully we're going to get to the point where we are putting in uh, less than 5000 a month for this space. The, um, the, the unfortunate thing about that space is we got it with the intent that we were going to be doing shows there all the time. Uh, I think the last slide we have will show you the show that we did there. Uh, unfortunately, it was right after the ghost ship fire. So when the ghost ship fire happened, the city of Alameda said, oh, it's a warehouse, it's gonna burst into flames. So you can't do any shows there, you can't have the public in there. And so we had to reduce it down to being our storage and workshop. Um, it's funny because Tim Arnold had come to our last show, the um, Shoot the Moon show, and he loved it. He loved the, the warehouse idea. He looked all around. And then he went back uh, to Las Vegas and he, and he wrote me an email. He says, 
I'm building a warehouse. It's going to be 44,500 square feet. <laughs> yeah, to get that you wanted to get 500 more. Um, and it turned out being 22,000 square feet. But uh, yeah, it, it, it definitely works. And that's kind of what we're looking for is a, a big open space, 20,000 to 25,000 square feet, where we can, if you've ever been to the Exploratorium, one of the things that we really want to do if we get a, a space like this is to have our shop in the middle so that all around it, you know, there'll be playable pinball machines and exhibits and things like that. But for people, I mean, one of the most fascinating things for me at the Exploratorium was to go up to the shop area and look at, at all those machines and, and all the things they were building there or, or fixing. And, and uh, it, it's just, you know, for somebody that's on the outside looking in, it's just the best experience is to see people working on these things. And it, and it um, lends itself to inviting people to, hey, come on into the shop. You want to learn something. Um, and, and you go from there. Mike touched a little bit about the uh, pros and cons of running a nonprofit. Um, it is management of volunteers. We're exceptionally lucky. We have an incredibly large pool of very dedicated and well-meaning volunteers who are trained and have become trained over time that we really rely upon. Um, kind of mentioned at the beginning of the presentation where maybe 60, 70 percent based on volunteer work, maybe higher. Um, so that's an important part of being a nonprofit and functioning as such with kind of limited income. Um, in terms of fundraising, um, it's really important. Um, as a nonprofit, our margins are small. Uh, most museums and nonprofits work on a 40 to 50 percent grant and fundraising support, 50 percent patron admission. Um, we're a lot closer to 70 or 80 percent patron admission, 20 percent grant and fundraising. Um, part of that is because it's pinball. Um, you know, there's there are nonprofits which are providing food to the unhoused, um, housing to the unhoused. Um, there are groups which are taking care of animals and animal shelters, and there's also medical uh, research groups as well. And in terms of fundraising, we kind of fall below those um, in terms of importance because we're not a living entity. Um, it is important and it's something that you have to pursue. It's just something that you, that's difficult you have to really work for. Um, so you have to pursue individual uh, donations, uh, grants, uh, support from government entities, and hopefully you also build and pursue relationships with individuals um, for estate planning as well is an important thing to follow. Um, Mike talked a little bit about our large annex building. And that's our current fundraising goal. Um, on the bottom left-hand side, you can see our pinball truck. Um, that's something we acquired two years ago, and it's been just an incredible tool. Um, for a long time, we were using a van and a trailer to pick up games, deliver games to conventions. Uh, maybe we'd rent a large truck. Now we have our own truck that can hold up to 12. Uh, games depending upon how we arrange it and that allows us to not only pick up more donations faster but go to more events um, go to places like uh, pride of the park when we do that event in alameda um, the california academy sciences your space center when we do other conventions um, go out there and it's also moving billboards so that was a really wonderful accomplishment for fundraising um, was getting us that truck and that was kind of the last piece of the pie before we were able to kind of concentrate on our current fundraising campaign which is for our capital building campaign, which is for a large permanent home. Um, we love our space on Webster Street. We love that we're able to bring over 100 games to the public because we have 1,300 more games. We'd really like that to be more like three to 600 games available to the public for play. Uh, we could manage that, we could make that accessible. We could have one of the largest places for pinball of any type, whether it was a private arcade or a pinball museum anywhere in the world available for people and having your own building allows you to not only make that investment but guarantee you can stay in that same spot forever and we get this uh, question a lot um, people who have not been able to come out to the annex because we have not been able to do a um, an exhibition there in the last five years a lot of people think it's akin to the end of raiders of the lost ark when you see the ark rolled into a giant warehouse. It is mind-blowing, it is overwhelming, and this is what we're able to bring to the public if we're able to fundraise the correct way. And uh, Mike was able to make this really wonderful panoramic that gives you a little bit of the sense of kind of the overwhelming amount of games that we have available for people. 
Yeah, this is actually, I, I made the panoramic shot from um, Steve Sabota. I don't know if a lot of people know Steve Sabota. He always bring these really fancy, incredible cameras to the shows. And, uh, and I've seen everything that he's done, but <laughs> this one kind of blew my mind. He, he had one that went all the way up to the top, which was about 35 feet, and got a panoramic shot of, of the whole uh, setup that we had done. Um, yeah, I just, I love looking at this. It's on my phone, in case I get lonely. Or <laughs> you get to look at that. It's um, impressive and it's overwhelming. It's a lot of games that we really want to bring to the public. Yeah. So one of the things that, that we're really lucky to have, too, is um, somebody who loves the wood rails. Because I know, I know it's not the most important pinball on people's playlist, but they are the, you know, the base of pinball. That's where flippers happened. And um, we have uh, Larry Zartarian, our board president, has uh, made it his goal to collect um, all the Gottlieb games, which I think he's, he's been successful in that. And then he started going after some of the um, interesting Williams, Valley, and Keeney uh, wood rails and early games. And I, I got to admit, at first I, I, I didn't understand it because I thought, well, it's, I, I was in the 70s pinball. And that's all I wanted to play. It's still kind of what I played. But when I started looking at those, looking at the art and I realized there was a whole other aspect to our museum, um, which I don't mention too much, and that's history. You can you can go through our museum and just look at the back glass art, and with a little maybe a handout or somebody explaining some of these things, because um, everybody's had to deal with Gen Z, right? <laughs> they don't know anything. Uh, if they walked through the pinball museum and look at the back glasses, and they get a pretty good history lesson. Um, maybe a little skewed, but <laughs> it's pinball. But it's amazing what you can glean from, just from the art on some of these machines. Uh, people look at it and go, you know, what's that all about? Oh, that was, you know, like the uh, the Zephyr. There was this uh, a train that used to go to, from Chicago to California. And it's got a pinball uh, back glass devoted to that. Um, just all sorts of stuff. Uh, when you get into the World War II era, you see all sorts of uh, kind of uh, offensive art uh, dealing with the people that w were our enemies at the time. You know, people ask, you know, why, why are you doing that? Well, because this is, you know, you can, you can gloss over it or you can explain it. And I think it's much better to explain these things. And uh, pinball is kind of like a bridge. Uh, it's it's a it's a way to to get to these difficult subjects. We just kind of uh, want to wrap things up. We have a little bit of time for a Q&A. I did want to say we left a whole bunch of our brochures at the uh, entry desk over in the other building, and uh, please visit us. Where uh, our website is pacificpinball.org. Um, if you can make it out to Alameda, we appreciate that. We're going to keep going to shows, bringing exhibits out to people. Um, but we definitely, with a couple minutes left, wanted to open up and see if there's any Q and A. Uh, Ron. One thing I brought up when I was at the museum the last few days is um, Tim in Las Vegas. I've gone there quite often, even when he was small, and then he got a little bigger, and then now he's on the strip. He lost what he had when he got big. When he got four or 500 games from 100 and some games, he completely lost what he had, which I thought was a good face to put on pinball. Um, and he doesn't seem to be able to know how to get around it. There's just too many games to keep going with. Like you said, he's more successful than you. I'd say not. I'd say the opposite. You're 100 times more successful than him. He may get more money coming in. <laughs> but he's not presenting pinball like you are. I think they agree with me. <laughs> so I'm concerned when you get a big building that you can have hundreds, hundreds of games to be played and maintain. 
how are you going to keep from losing what he lost? That's a great question, Ron. I appreciate that. Um, currently, with, with the way the museum on Webster is set up, we have rooms broken into uh, modern, history, exhibits. Um, we have really wonderful artwork on the walls. We also have jukeboxes um, that are defined by their era along with the games of the machines that they're situated around. Um, a larger space, um, we would endeavor to decorate just as interestingly. Um, things would still be broken up into exhibits, in sections uh, to make sense and kind of be compartmentalized. And um, that's true. There is a scale of logistics involved with offering more machines. Um, realistically, as much as we would love to have 1,300 machines available for people to play, we focus on more to three to 600 as a possible logistical support that we're able to do. And it would, it would, it would require a scale of uh, volunteering, um, a scale of training that we're willing to chase, uh, kind of in a dream of the ultimate museum. Um, what we've established and the feedback we've heard from the smaller museum on Webster is really important to us and your experiences are really important to us. And that's something we definitely want to hold on to and are going to make a really important uh, goal. I appreciate that, Ron. Yeah. And the museum has to have bar stools for all the old people trying to play. <laughs> <laughs> we'll definitely have bar stools. <laughs> was there another question? You, sir. Yeah. I, I I was just wondering, seeing your photos, how many machines did you have set up at that last uh, Annex show? I think there, I think there was about 560. Oh games. wow! Yeah, it was very impressive. Oh, David back there. So I think 450. 450. Okay. Wow. Cool. Very yeah. impressive. It was uh, a lot. I, I missed it. You can't have shows there. <laughs> uh, yeah. You sir. Yeah. Are you guys? Uh, Logistically, um, it'd be helpful to, um, as, as a nonprofit and raising the money the way we, we can, um, we probably can't be too choosy. Um, so we're we're really looking at a uh, place in Pacific Grove, uh, which is just right below Monterey, and that was a little too far for some of our decks to want to go. But, um, you know, we're, uh, actually, I think that that's a, a good area, and I'm going to keep poking around there because it's affordable. Believe it or not, it's affordable, and it has a lot of tourists. And um, taking a, you know, a, a play from uh, Tim's playbook, I, I think we need to be near tourists. I mean, our, our dream was to always be in the city, but... You know, unfortunately, we're, we've been behind the eight ball. We've, uh, you know, the prices just keep going up. When we got close to uh, working with the city, they kind of pulled the rug on us on that one, that we were, we were going to be in the Carnegie. Um, and, and, you know, I, it was kind of devastating when we didn't get it. And then another person who was helping us try to get into the Carnegie, he, he tried to get it, and he had a lot more uh, money that coming in for this and everything and he failed so and it's still empty so we're we're, uh, we're just realizing well maybe we're dealing with the wrong people here um, one thing I wanted to say is my, my wife um, who was a co-founder of this whole thing um, you know we had a long talk we're, we're getting older we, we have property that uh, was didn't come by us easy I um, I rebuilt my house, and she, she did kind of the same in Berkeley. But we've already filled out our will. Uh, we're leaving everything to the museum. So they're going to, and don't take any pot shots at me, please. I'd like to do this on my own time. But all of it's going to be going to the museum, and so the museum is going to have uh, uh, quite a bit of funding when we're gone. So that's going to be part of the survivability of it. And other, uh, we've gotten some hints from other people that they were, they were willing to do something like that. They just haven't put it in the writing like we have. <laughs> I think we, uh, we ran into our 12 o'clock, oh. but uh, my name's Evan, the executive director, along with Mike, the uh, founder. We just really appreciate everybody yeah. that came to listen today. It means a lot to us. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. <laughs>